AM team brings simulations very close to reality using a unique combination of computational dynamics and mechanics to assist clients to optimize their designs. Um, it's a Ghent University spin-off company with clients all across the globe. Um, uh, Dr. Oda has spoken at many conferences and international events. So um, let's all unmute and give a round of applause to Dr. Oda. <laughs> Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks so much for the introduction. I will share my screen. Uh, I hope it works, but usually it does. Huh? Zoom it. Can you? Okay. You see my screen? We'll just full screen mode. So, can you all see my screen? Yeah, perfect. All right. All right. So, we can get started. Yeah, thanks a lot for the introduction. Um, I think we have uh, like one hour, if I'm correct. Um, yeah, that's uh, yeah. Just just stop me if I have to stop because I know myself. If, if I start talking, uh, it can uh, take a while. Uh, but uh, I will really keep uh, try to keep within the time. Um, it's my pleasure to be uh, lecturing for you actually. Um, so see, Avash contacted me, and uh, yeah, it was actually. Uh, very fast decision for me to give uh, a lecture for you, because on the on the one hand, um, I think yeah, well, this stuff of course I love talking about it. It's it's our job. It's what we do. But on the other hand, I think uh, talking about modeling and and the digital tools we have today is very important because it becomes very 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 important and it is expected to gain importance to keep gaining importance in the future. I think so. Um, yeah, it's quite a content here, but I have to try to include a lot of examples, a lot of practical case examples. And uh, so so you really get a good idea on what are the real applications are of advanced modeling or digital twins, wh whatever you call them. But actually, it's models you actually uh, yeah treat, describe processes with. So the type, title of my lecture today is Advanced Modeling and Digital Twins in Wastewater Treatment and Resource Recovery. So it also includes water reuse, for example, closing the loop. Uh, and I will be talking about the applications, the state of the art, but also a bit about the future. Um, always interesting to look at that. So uh, if I look at myself like one decade ago or a bit more than a decade ago, let's say, let's say 11 years ago, uh, I was actually saying this. So me doing a PhD in modeling, so what the heck can you do with modeling? I had really no clue what it was and what the practical value would be. So why would you actually model a system? Why would you put this effort in it? And actually, what can the model learn you that you can actually not learn without the model? And it was really a big question I had. I really had no answers. I only learned it by working on models, starting to work on them, developing them and applying them. Of course, now we have a very good idea. We have a company built on model. We, it's our core business. But back then, and, and maybe few of you still, of, or many of you, still have this uh, this idea uh, that what, what can you do with it? So I hope at the end of this presentation, this will be very clear to you. Uh, if you talk about modeling, simulation, digital, you can drop a lot of words here. Eh? AI, uh, statistical models, data-driven, whatever you call it. Actually, I came to the conclusion that there are a lot of fancy words used in the industry, but but few practitioners know which tools are out there, what the differences between these tools are, and actually how these tools can be helpful. And this is really key, because if you don't know the tools, and actually if you have never seen practical case examples, you will not use them, or you will also not like hire a company for you to do some modeling or whatever whatever uh, modeling, how, how you will rely on modeling. So it's it's really key. Uh, and I think this is a very good initiative that was taken, uh, well, not asking me, but asking somebody to talk. Uh, uh, well, I hope it was a good decision to ask me, <laughs> but I mean, asking somebody to talk about the practical application of modeling. Um, so actually what is needed is education and showcases uh, that this is really needed to successfully go digital. And going digital is not only a necessity, it is actually unavoidable. We will have to go there and we will we will just go there. So a short introduction on myself. Um, 
people in the United States sometimes, well, very often actually call me Elvis because sometimes from time to time I do some Elvis performances. That picture on this slide was taken in New Orleans or Chicago. I think it was Chicago. So every year, well, in regular times, let's say, uh, uh, I do a small performance uh, at WEFTEC, this big event on water, uh, wastewater and resource recovery. Uh, and I, I love it very much. So singing is one of my hobbies. I'm not saying I'm the best singer, but I love it. Um, I, I'm co-founder, actually pro, proud co-founder uh, and CEO at AM Team. I found this company four years ago four and a bit years ago with two other colleagues at Ghent University. Uh, I'm a husband and father of three kids. That's my first business, let's say, the home business. And I have a PhD and a master's degree in environmental engineering obtained uh, at Ghent University in Belgium. Um, my favorite quote is, every threat to the status quo is an opportunity in disguise. Uh, I think this is so relevant if you look at digital. There are so many things that can be changed, uh, and there are so many opportunities. Uh, I'm working with the author, actually, Jay Samet, on a, a Dutch uh, translation of the book, actually, uh, Disrupt You. So this book is highly re recommended. So who are we? What is AM Team? The name AM Team was actually derived from the A Team. You are probably familiar with the A Team. Um, well, younger people are typically familiar with the cartoons. But actually, the television series was a series of the 80s. Uh, it's actually a bit before my my age, actually. But the A-team is a complementary set of people, and they are really able to do spectacular missions. And this is the core philosophy of our company, bringing together really good people, complementary people, to do very, very nice stuff. And that's uh, very strong missions. This is our current team. But we cannot keep up with this picture. We have to continuously update it. Uh, we are really higher, well, are growing quite fast. Uh, many of these people have engineering backgrounds. It's a mixture of environmental, bioscience, chemical engineering, mechanical engineering. It's a mixture of people. Um, actually, this team, uh, yeah, uh, the work they do, how they are, actually makes me personally very happy every day. Um, I can say that. We have very good customer ratings. The reason I'm putting it on this slide is not really doing sales. The reason I'm putting it on the slide is if you are a modeling and simulation company, you have to really offer practical solutions to the markets. If not, you will not exist for very long. And actually, I can say that our customers are extremely happy. They didn't really know many of the things we were doing were possible in the first place. And then if you deliver these results, well, they are really, really very excited. Um, and uh, yeah, that's that's uh, something we like talking about. It's very important. It's very important because the market really decides. So who are our customers? What do we do? Well, we are a company that actually provides cutting edge process simulation services to the global water industry. But actually recently, we also launched a business unit process industry, for example, working on pharma. And actually, across these industries, there are so many similarities, so many same challenges uh, and same um, yeah, uh, trends. We are headquartered in Belgium. Our, head, uh, our headquarters is in Ghent. Actually, I'm in Ghent right now. Uh, a nice city. If you're in Belgium, you should really visit it. It's, it's a medieval city. Very nice to visit. Um, and uh, our core strength of our company is really combining cutting edge simulation capabilities so we believe we are very good at the stuff we are doing, but also, so so we combine it with the process knowledge and understanding. We are process engineers that are very good at modeling. So there is not, we try to avoid this disconnect between modeling and the process side. And really then you are in a unique spot to offer very good solutions. Who are our customers? Well, we have three main categories. We have the end users, which are utilities. For example, if you look at the US, uh, we have actually uh, DC Water, HRSD, uh, close, well, that's the, the East Coast. And then uh, we are also work together with a couple of uh, drinking water companies uh, at the West Coast, actually in Southern California. So on this world map, you see a couple of our customers, ongoing projects, and these orange balls, I added them for this talk, actually. These are ongoing projects in the US. 
So we, we are currently active in uh, Michigan, Virginia. Um, then we also have Nevada and Southern California. You couple, yeah, a couple of the other logos are, um, yeah, technology companies developing and really selling technologies. Examples are Xylem or Air Liquide. A lot of these logos are actually confidential. That's a pity. Um, but, uh, and the third category is consulting and engineering firms. Probably, you know, some of the names like Sweco, Arcadis, uh, and others. So this is what we do for them. How do we help them? Well, we optimize existing processes. We help designing new processes to be built. And we also help them scaling up new technologies. So that's really in the early development phase. Even. Good. Let's start with process simulation. What is process simulation and how can it be useful? A very basic uh, scheme, but I like this scheme. It's um, by actually my co-founder, Professor Ingmar Nopens. He's still professor at Ghent University but Ingmar is also involved at the AM team. And this is a scheme that explains very nicely why, why you should be doing modeling or what is the real underlying reason. What are the process engineering challenges? There, there are many. Actually, if you're a process engineer, you actually want to obtain a desired system. A desired system can be less in energy. It can be have optimal performance. For example, if you look at water reuse, you want the water quality with a certain quality, guaranteed, reliable, but it can also be a limited footprint. It can be different. It can mean different things, uh, your desired system. But how do you get from where you are now to that system? Well, often, if you, ha if you have no modeling tools available, you have to experiment. And it's often based on trial and error. You know it can take long, and sometimes you have these failures this is this red arrow going back and it can take a while. It's uh, it can provide in some cases a little bit of learning and sometimes your system works, but you're not 100% convinced or you don't really understand why. So there, there's a couple of challenges here. Well, what if you would construct a virtual reality? So what if we would build a model of our system? It can be a treatment process. I'm just naming one example. Let's say an activated sludge process, and you're creating an ASM model with it. You're building your plant virtually. What can you do with that? Well, you can do virtual experimentation. Virtual experimentation is actually simulation. This is what you are going to do. You are doing simulations to learn new things. How would the system respond to certain dynamics? What would be the optimal size of this plant? Can we change the controls of the plant? Can we lower dosing to save, save some energy? All types of questions. You go through these iterations with the model and you end up with a virtual desired system. This is actually the system as it should be working, but it's still in the model. But then of course you can go back to reality and you can implement this system in practice. So this is called yeah the modeling shortcut you're trying to make. In the meantime, of course, you are trying to, uh, to learn a lot of new things. This is a PhD thesis. I would actually highly recommend you to read. Uh, it is freely to, uh, downloadable at the Wageningen University website. It's a Dutch university. It's called Dynamics of Water Innovation by Paul O'Callaghan. Very, very clearly written. But it's one of the few works, if not the only PhD, actually, I have seen on the innovation in the water industry. So if you look at innovation in the water industry, we can conclude it's very slow and the cycles are very, very long. Let's go to one example. If you look at UV disinfection, it's a technology probably most of you are familiar with. It's a very old technology. So you can see it, it was actually developed in the 60s. It took 10 years to enter the market then it reached the innovators, and actually it took one decade more to reach mainstream market adoption. So we are not talking about a smartphone that is actually developed today and commercially available within three years. In the water industry, things take long, and there are multiple reasons for that. Multiple. These reasons are nicely explained uh, in the book. I will not go to, into detail, but the conclusions are here. Well, in the R&D stage of a new treatment process or technology, well, it can take up to 10 years. 
from pilot to mainstream market is another 11 to 16 years. And then once you build the system and you run and operate it, the expected lifespan is 25 years, up to 25 years. It's a bit less for electronic equipment or, or engines or things like that. But like the civil works, it can be there for 25 years or, or longer. So, well, a lot of time. And the question is, uh, uh, this is, a, this is a really a key question or a, a key observation we have. Digital should be used to, on one hand, accelerate tech development cycles. So if we can lower the time to markets, new technologies will come to the market way earlier. But on the other hand, we also have to accelerate the tech technology adoption. So the market uptake. If you have a new technology, it's not sufficient. You have to put it in the market and then it still takes a lot of time. What if we could use models also to accelerate that? What if we could also use models to optimally design this very long living infrastructure? Because you, if you, if you build something that costs you millions of, of dollars easily, right? Big plans are, are, are easily much more than that. And you have to operate it for 20, 25 years. You, you better do it very well and you better make sure that your energy consumption and your efficiency is as optimal as possible. And then can we also use models if your system is in operation to update infrastructure throughout all these decades and make best use of the existing infrastructure? So these are like four very, very different applications, but I think they are very, very important and models can help in all of them. So how can they help? Huh? This is a quite an extensive slide. And now we, be, we will go to the practical case examples. But this slide gives you actually a very, very uh, yeah, deep overview of all what's possible. We will go through it gradually, okay? I will not try to go too fast. Um, so first, you have actually an R&D and scale-up phase. This is where you start. When you develop a new process, uh, all of the current technologies, one day they were in R&D stage, okay? Many new ones are still in R&D stage. Many other ones just uh, entered the market. But step number zero, let's call it, is technology development. Well, what if you could actually use models for virtual prototyping of that technology and accelerate its scale off? One example on the screen, on this computer screen, is a CFD simulation. I will explain more about CFD later, computational fluid dynamics. But you can see on this little screen that we are actually simulating different prototypes of a reactor without building all of them. Only the best one is built, okay? And not all of the scales are built. Maybe we can write, like scale, uh, skip two or three pilots scales. So that's very important. Important questions are scale up and optimal design in the technology development cycle. Uh, we have a lot of customers that saved over a year or multiple years by using this. And this is not, not uh, well, uh, well, not, uh, this is really significant. It's, uh, if you talk, it's not like a couple of weeks. We are coupling, uh, well, talking about a year or more. Well, then when you have successfully developed your technology, well, you, you bring it to the market. If you bring it to the market, it will start competing with other technologies. For example, an activated sludge process, or let's say a granular activated sludge process, granular sludge, it has competitors. Another a competitor is an MBBR, moving that bi uh, bioreactor. It's a competitor. You have lots of competitive technologies on the market. So when you enter the market, your customers will do a technology selection. They will select the right technology for their case. So in this phase, well, we can actually use models for virtual piloting. People often do pilots on site. They build like a small scale test facility of a certain technology to pilot it under real conditions. That is the main reason. Real dynamics, your site specific water matrix, let that test the technology and see if it would perform and then based on that, we can actually do some ballpark calculations of operational cost, full scale cost of a, of a big installation if we would build it. But we have seen lots of examples where you can actually not build a physical pilot on site, but instead build a virtual pilot or a virtual full scale installation. 
And the questions it can answer is, what is the suitability of this technology and what would be the cost and performance if we were to build a future full-scale installation? Then we have uh, another step. When you have selected your technology, just imagine, okay, we will build this granular activated sludge. You do a conceptual design. The conceptual design is all about size, basic equipment, basic ballpark cost estimations. This is conceptual design. Well, you can actually use models there to virtually design trains. So you built this plant virtually, for example, using your... Uh, or a simulator model, it can be a sumo model, it can be a bio-win model, whatever it is. And it allows you to run some dynamics and answer questions like size, operational strategies, things like that. That is the conceptual design. Once you are through that phase, you go to the detailed design. Detailed design answers more detailed questions. For example, what is the ideal shape of my reactor? So it's more detailed than size. Where do, where do we put baffles? Where do we put inlet, outlet structures? Can we improve dosing efficiency? This is like the fine tuning right before the construction. That's detailed design. Computational fluid dynamics is an extremely powerful tool in that stage. Because I, as I told, these things are built to last 20, 25 years. Well, you better make sure they are optimally designed. And there are many, many gains to be made. Once you have built your process, you start operating and monitoring it. Well, models can be helpful there. This is called the digital twin. I will talk about more, a bit more about digital twins later, but yeah, there's a lot of confusion as well in the market. It's overly used, this, 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 uh, this name, but actually comes down to uh, a copy, a digital copy of your real process. And this digital copy can provide you information that you can actually not measure in your real process. That's the added value. So real-time monitoring of key variables, that is really a very, very important application of digital twins or even running parallel scenarios uh, that are not possible to conduct with the real plants. Then we go to um, yeah the long-term operation and then you go to optimization and retrofitting. Maybe a decade later, you have to extend the capacity, you have to replace some equipment, things like that. Again, over there, you can virtually do process optimization using models. And there you talk about dosing efficiency, baffle placement, thing again. So this is just the application of models throughout the whole technology life cycle. And you can see this is the, this is the cycle that really takes a long, uh, long, uh, long way. One very, very critical, well, very basic example that I like very much is this reactor. So you put in two aerators, they inject oxygen. So where you see the red colors, you see a lot of mixing, but then you have dark blue zones near the bottom. What if you actually move the equipment a little bit, half a meter, you rotate it five degrees. That's all we did actually. The whole reactor is actually mixed. You, you're, you get rid of these dark blue zones, right? This is this example. This is an example we use um, quite often because it's, it's really nicely illustrates, if I go back a bit, um, how sensitive design decisions are, right? So you have a very bad system here, and you this is the top view. Huh? You, we are looking at a cross-section of velocities. Dark blue is low velocity. Red is very high mixing velocity. And sludge could actually settle near the bottom if you not design it properly. But why is this relevant? Well, because these people could actually save an external recirculation loop with an external pump by simply placing the equipment a bit better. So same mixing energy, much more efficient mixing. It's, it's an example we use very, very often to illustrate how simple actually the outcomes often are. So what is computational fluid dynamics? It is a physics tool. The, the core is really physics. I will not put the equations on the slide, but you can uh, yeah, include the liquid, which is often water in the water industry, of course. You can include your solids, which can be particles, flux, crystals. You can include the gas phase if you are looking at oxygenation or aeration or maybe stripping processes, gas is included. And then you can also include your kinetics. Um, so 
biochemical phenomena, for example, an ASM model can be directly integrated in CFD. And this is actually what you see on the right. It's one example. In this case, we integrated ASM 2D in CFD, providing not only like velocities or some dead zones, it provides you the concentration gradients in 3D. In this case, it's volatile fatty acids in this reactor. You can see immediately that this reactor is not a completely mixed tank. It is not a so-called CSTR. You have huge gradients ranging between 45 milligrams per liter to, let's say, below 20. And this is typically the case in big systems. You cannot really easily mix systems. A good illustration of that is this one. This is a two liter batch reactor. Maybe you have seen it in the lab. It's a respirometer. So you add some activated sludge in here. You add some wastewater sample in that reactor. You start aerating it to get your basic parameters of your activated sludge. These are often used to calibrate your ASM model, right? I don't know if you have done it in the lab, but it's often used. Look at this two liters reactor. It's a lab scale reactor. Despite the small volume, you still have significant gradients of ammonia, oxygen, and nitrates. So these papers were published. If you would like to have them, uh, drop me an email. Huh? Okay, I can send them to you. But I like this case very much because it just illustrates it's very, very hard to not yeah, get gradients. It's complete systems, completely mixed systems are so hard to design. Well, at, at least uh, in economic terms, right? Another category of tools next to CFD, computational fluid dynamics, is flow sheet models. The name flow sheet models are not often used in the, in the water industry. It's more called process models. This is your SUMO model, your WEST model, your BioWind model. All these simulators, they are flow sheet models. You see the flow sheet of your system. Why? What can you do with it? Well, this, this model will not answer where you put your baffle, how you configure your inlet. This is CFD. But these models answer your dynamic questions. You run some dynamic water quality through, through your virtual installation, and then you can do some what-if testing. In this specific case on the slide, uh, this, this was a virtual ozonation plant. You don't want ozone residual in the affluent. You want all your ozone to, de to be decomposed in your installation because it has some safety implications, right? The question here, very practical, was how far can we reduce the size of the system in order to save capital costs? Of course, it's less concrete, huh? if the reactor can be half the size, but without having significant ozone residual throughout the year. And this is why the dynamics are at play. Maybe 50% of the time you will have no residual if you make it smaller, but then maybe the 50 remaining percentages, you might be facing issues. So these models allow you to actually stress test. Still then you can use safety factors but likely the safety factors will be less. So it's much more efficient process design actually. So you can see we actually uh, reduced the size uh, gradually in this simulation um, uh, and, and then uh, looked at the residuals. And of course, if you make it half, you have higher residuals if you look at the, the Y axis. But it's, yeah, let's not go into detail too much. Well, let's talk a bit by, about digital twins. It's a word you, uh, really here all over the place. It is actually a strong marketing term. It's used everywhere. Just search for the hashtag digital twin on LinkedIn. I'm sure you will find a lot of stuff. But then these are quotes of people I recently talked to, like recently is the last 12 months, because nowadays it's very hard to talk to. Huh? Um, but they are from academia. They are from data visualization companies like Ritmeyer. Academia is KWR in the Netherlands, or they are from simulator companies like Dynamita providing the, the tool Sumo. Well, Imre, he's a very good partner of us. We work with him and his team very closely. He says, well, digital twins, actually, they exist for decades. They are now just called this way. And he's actually right. The ASM models were introduced in the 80s. Well, if you have an ASM model in the 80s and you have the real plant as well, you have a digital twin, actually. The question is, is it operating in real time in parallel with the real plant? Okay. But in fact, he's, he's completely right. It's not you. 
we just uh, yeah use this terminology right now. Another person I talked to recently, last week, David Durmat, he's from Rittmeyer. They do a lot of fancy data processing and visualizations. It's a German company, no, a Swiss company, if I'm correct. Um, well, he said, let's first decide what it means. Because, yeah, if you talk about digital twin, person A and B can actually mean very, very different things. And then Prof. Dragan Salvich from KWR in the Netherlands, he said, well, actually, everybody seems to have an own definition of a digital twin. What, what is our own definition? My personal definition is a digital twin is a digital tool that allows you to visualize what you cannot measure based on what you can measure. And that implies value, right? If you have a model that can provide you key variables, you, you would really like to know, but there are no sensors for them. Well, that, that is real value. You feed that digital twin with sensors you have, and then you use some fancy models or mathematics to come to the variables you cannot measure, but are interested in. Uh, but a lot of debate going on, and uh, but I'm sure, yeah, a lot of papers will appear in the coming years making some clarity, yeah? because uh, practitioners are quite confused. Okay, let's go to the case examples here. Um, let's start, I, I will give case examples one or two for every step from technology development to the final retrofitting or process optimization. Okay, step zero, one, two, three, four. I will case, give case examples for each of them. Let's start with a case example from the R&D stage. So this is the stage in which people are developing a technology that is not yet on the market. This is an example of a new MBR. It's an, a membrane bioreactor I personally expect MBRs to become. MBR is expensive. It's energy consuming. Um, they, they, well, of course, if you use an MBR and membranes to then discharge on a surface water body, it is quite overtreated and expensive. But if you keep water reuse and water scarcity in mind, MBRs, with, also with their compact footprints, might gain importance. We have a Japanese customer, a Japanese technology company that has developed the BMBR, the baffled MBR. You can see the baffles in the middle of this little tank, right? These are these, these black vertical lines are two baffles, right? So this video shortly illustrates how this system works. I will quickly play it. So you actually operate it as an SBR. You fill it with raw wastewater. You start treating it. The water level reaches the baffle. Oxygen go cannot go over anymore. The outer zone becomes anoxic. You fill it again and you aerate it completely again. So you can, well, uh, look it up. It's in the literature as well. Uh, I will not try to lose too much time in expl expl explaining this technology. But the thing is, they play with gradients in one system. So they try to avoid having two reactors, one for aeration, and one for actually anoxic denitrification. They just put it all together and with a baffle in the same reactor, they can create these compartments. Of course, there are a lot of challenges. They were, by the time we joined the project, they were at three cubic meters. Well, an MBR at three cubic meters is a pilot. It is not really a commercially viable scale. They wanted to go in one step to 100 cubic meters. Usually people would actually go maybe to 10 or 30 cubic meters, not to 100 in one step. So what we have done is built them all. Why? Well, because it's quite hard to design it. These are all the things you can pick, like filling time, emptying time, aeration rate, the shape of your MBR, reactor dimensions, the height of your membranes, the number of inlets. Choose it. So if you want to test all of these different variables as a process engineer, while well, you might be in development for 20 or 30 years, you cannot, and you will burn all the money. You can simply not test all, all of these variables. Not in reality, but if you have a model, you can. So what we did is actually we built a CFD model. I will just show you simulation. Uh, and actually it's, it's exactly the same thing that happens. You see the water going down and up, oxygen going on, down and up. And this is a CFD model that includes the bubbles. It includes the ASM model. So you see 
nitrification, denitrification go on, and it's actually happening at the left here. See, the water level is below the baffle, and this dark blue zone, well, it's turning dark blue, is getting an OPSEC. Okay, so this is what we have uh, done conceptually for for that. Well, then that is the, of course the real value. You have these pilots at the left, these three cubic meters pilots. You build a CFD model of that, which we have done. We use the same CFD model to scale it up. So we built a virtual full scale of 100 cubic meters. Well, actually we built five or six or seven candidates full scale systems. And then you pick the right one, the best one, and you can build it. And this is what they have done. So the one on the picture here is the 100 cubic meter system. It's actually actually already more <laughs> um, built in uh, in Tokyo, Japan, on on one of the biggest plants. Uh, so it's very very nice to see that the system then also works as expected, <laughs> right? Because it's always a bit stressy, stressy if you're a process well a simulation engineer, you are doing these recommendations and these people then build the system, uh, which is not cheap, huh? um, but it works. It works. Of course, they save significant costs. Piloting costs, measurements, man hours, but also in this first stage, because they will scale up further to 1,000 cubic meters, it's at another order of magnitude higher. Well, up till now in stage one, they already saved over a year, over a year time to market. It's really, really a lot if you want to go on the market because one year is burning money with a new technology is a lot if you start a new pump or a new business adventure. So you can see we tested different designs and one of those designs had the best performance in terms of permeate quality, lowest COD, lowest uh, ammonia, and things like that. This is another example uh, of R&D. It's a virtual prototyping. It's not really a scale-up. The membranes were existing at this scale. It's a tubular membrane. We are looking inside a tube of a membrane. At the top, you see the regular membrane, which, which is just a shaft and the water is flowing through, these color gradients give you the shear on the surface. Your water causes a shear, which actually rinses or cleans the membranes. It avoids foil falling. And then you can actually prototype. What if we would actually build in some, yeah, some ridges, or we create some swirling, turbulence by structural changes on the surface of the membrane? Would it give us more shear for the same flow rate? Because if there would be more shear, there would be less flow uh, falling, and there would be more flux and longer. Well, indeed, if you look at both candidates here, and you look at the Raymond Nopens curves, this is actually a tool we developed in-house. It summarizes in 2D what these 3D uh, CFD results give you. But the nice thing is the, these two membranes are on one graph. You can compare them. This is actually the shear distribution shear stress over on the membrane surface over the membrane area. And you can definitely see in this helix uh, rich case that the shear is much higher. The whole curve shifts to the right. You only have limited regions with a bit less shear actually. Here, these are the, the regions after these ridges. But uh, mainly the curve shifts to the right uh, completely. While in reality, this uh, membrane really worked very well. I must say this memory was on the market already, yeah? uh, but we have done a lot of extra simulations, which we unfortunately cannot uh, show. But it, it, sh it just shows how deep in a scale, how small in a scale you can go. Okay, this is step number one, virtual piloting. Replacement of real piloting, complete or partial replacement by, uh, by models in the technology selection phase. So we had one customer in the Netherlands, it's waterboard the Dommel. It's actually utility, treating wastewater in city of Eindhoven, Netherlands, and uh, well, and other cities as well. But we built a virtual ozonation plant, which you can see on this screen. Uh, it's a virtual uh, ozonation plant with our model Amazon. So the Amazon tool is a, a model we actually developed in-house. You can call it similar to ASM, but it's not for activated sludge, it's for ozonation. So it predicts bromate formation, which is unwanted if you do ozonation. It predicts ozone decay and the removal of 
pharmaceuticals and disinfection as well. So this is the, the digital, well, I cannot say digital twin because the real plant is not built. It's not a twin. It's the digital full scale, huh? the digital virtual pilot or full scale. You see uh, some dynamics. We put in some dynamics of the real plant with sensors that are on the real plant. The only difference is you have no real pilots, but the pilot is running on a computer. Of course, we took some samples. Uh, I, I will come back to the respirometer. You calibrate your models on the specific matrix or wastewater. You calibrate it and then you are ready to use it. So this is what we have done. It was already in the COVID times uh, and that's what you can see here on the masks. The cool thing is, yeah, then you can run a lot of scenarios. For example, we have tested like five, six, seven different ozonation dosing strategies. If you would have a real pilot installation, maybe you can test one or two at max, not five or six. On the other hand, if you have a real pilot, you have to do a lot of micro pollutant analysis. Pharmaceuticals that are in the range of nanograms per liter are very expensive to measure. And still, you pay a lot for the analysis, still you have one data point. Uh, of course, the model can provide you all these dynamics, and it gives you the specific removals for all of these micro pollutants. In this case, it's around 19. Some of them you know, uh, like uh, I'm pretty sure you know diclofenac, uh, diclofen diclofenac, is this the this pronunciation? I'm not sure. In Flemish, it's uh, diclofenac, uh, <laughs> diclofenac. But then you can see, uh, you can compare it with the regulation. If the regulation asks, hey man, remove by 70%, at least seven out of this 19 or 11 out of this 19, well, you can see with the scenarios how many of them then reach the criteria. And what if regulation would change in the future? What if would yeah it would become 80%? You can still do scenarios for them. So we've done, we, we've done a lot of scenarios. I uh, will not go for all of them. This was a virtual pilot. So these people, of course, saved easily one and a half years of piloting. They did actually in six weeks what they uh, were supposed to do in one and a half years and for an order of magnitude higher in cost. Don't forget, if you put a pilot on site, somebody has to operate it. Who has to operate it? The plant operators. The plant operators are actually very busy people. They are very busy people. They are extremely busy with having the, the daily operations of the current plant. Well, if you have a new pilot, it's all extra overhead and training. And in the case of ozonation, you have extra safety measures as well. So yeah, in this, in this case, it's more than this one and a half years, huh, the value. Well, let's say you have selected this technology and you want to design it. Well, this is virtual reactor design. This is an example of that. So this is a plant in Italy, in Alta Badia. It's a ski area uh, where they have uh, really nice mountains. This was one of the best projects we have done because the location was fantastic. Um, a lot of peaks uh, because they have the ski season, which gives you a lot of wastewater. And then you have the down season where you hardly have any wastewater. You have to very flexibly design this plant. One of our customers, uh, Dr. Bernard Wett, uh, he has written a lot of uh, different uh, papers eh? and he's a very well-known technologist, including in the US. He has developed this AAA technology. It stands for alternating activated adsorption. It's actually an A-stage process. So it is actually activated sludge but instead of like burning your COD, your organics, you will you will actually in, in, uh, sorry decrease the SRT the sludge residence time significantly. What happens is your sludge suddenly has to eat much faster. Well, because it realizes, hey, I'm just in this reactor maybe for a couple of hours, so I just have to take all of the COD I'm able to. Well, they don't eat it all at once. They are smart. They evolve and they start absorbing it. So they start building fat. Of course, if you have bacteria that start abs absorbing COD instead of burning it, you have to aerate less. And then, of course, if you have your sludge settled and you digest it, 
your fat sludge having adsorbed the COD, but not yet converted it to CO2, has much more biogas potential. So A-stage treatment is uh, not new again. It, I think it was there in the 70s, but it revived with the resource uh, recovery and process intensification. Well, in this specific case, you have inlet structures at the bottom. These are these pipes here. So the water's coming in into the system. Uh, the water's pushed through these lateral pipes. And then the outlet is this pipe. The outlet pipe is also shown here uh, in the feet. Yeah, this pipe here at the surface. So it's an alternating system. That's the first A. If one of the reactors is in aeration mode, the other one is in decanting or settling. Okay? This allows continuous operation with two discontinuous uh, tanks. Well, let's look at some very nice colorful figures. Uh, CFD is always colorful. Um, the, the initial design actually had a big dead zone. What you can see here, this dark blue color indicates that your incoming flow is not very well distributed. So this this zone here, this dark blue zone, has nearly, well, actually almost none, uh, no uh, new wastewater coming in. And then you have other zones that actually have much more flow, dark, green, or yellowish zones. Well, what if you do some very simple pipe modifications? Well, you cannot do that in reality because the system was already in operation. Yeah. So you have no flexibility to test 10 designs and empty the tank all the time. It, it's just simply impossible. So what you do is you do minor modifications. In this case, we did, did minor modifications inside the pipes. And then you easily end up with a very well-performing system. This was, again, the system they have built in practice. Again, exciting moment for us. Will it work? Well, it works. So it works. Um, less sludge washout risks and much better fluidization of your sludge planks. So it's a, it, again, it's often not rocket science. Eh? These outcomes of the models, often they are very easy things, but after the fact, they look easy. But if you don't have the model, it's so hard to come with them. Let's go to the operational stage now, uh, operation monitoring of the system. So this is the digital twin application I was talking about. So building a, par uh, a parallel virtual model plant in parallel with your real system. So the left figure here illustrates the real system. This one on the PC screen illustrates the virtual digital. This is a nice example from the Netherlands. Um, it's again micropollutants trace organic contaminants. Many of them are pharmaceuticals, pesticides, other types of organics. Organics you don't want in the water, especially if you look at water reuse and uh, drinking water production. Another example we are working on in the US that is more closer to you is uh, the SWIFT project in HRSD in Virginia. Uh, this is actually one of the biggest indirect potable reuse projects in the world. So they are converting wastewater affluents to drinking water standards with a plant. Uh, yeah, this is where it all started for us with this Amazon model. But this, again, uh, this is a Dutch plant. This is not that plant. And what you see is uh, at the top here, the virtual plant, which is the digital twin, because there is a real plant. And we have just copied it with a model. In Sumo, again, here, uh, we use Sumo quite often for Amazon uh, model. Your water comes in at the left, it goes through these ozonation reactors, and then you have some pipes and reaction go. Downstream, there is not only a, well, ozonation plant, but also UV peroxide. UV hydrogen peroxide is an advanced oxidation process, giving extra oxidation of the target contaminants. The ones that are actually maybe less easy to oxidize with ozone. Well, what you can see on this graph is 40 different trace organic contaminants. We, we had to anonymize them, unfortunately, a bit, but there are a lot of pharmaceuticals and uh, very well-known components. You can see the measurements, which are the orange bars. So this is the removal percentage, the removal after ozonation. And then you can see the projections, which are the blue bars. Generally, this model performs very well. You can see it predicts all of these individual components, and you can immediately see that some are 
more difficult to remove than others, which are close to 100% removed. Some of them are closer to 20 to 30% removed. But not only this, you can actually see that the model predicts a whole bunch of extra target contaminants that they could not measure. Either they didn't have the analytical equipment or the components were below detection limit. So this is an ad additional benefit of such digital twins. The thing I was talking about, you use a digital twin to tell you variables, tell you about variables you cannot measure based on things you can measure. That's actually a good uh, application of it. Same plants, another variable, bromate. Bromate is a product, it's a byproduct of ozonation that is uh, carcinogenic. So you have to avoid it. You don't have to open this ozone. Yeah? And uh, am I still in the meat? Can you still hear me, guys? Because I, ha I had a notification here on my screen. Can somebody say something? Okay, we have some technical issues, but I'm coming back. Okay. In the meantime, I will continue for the LinkedIn audience a bit. Uh, um, so we have this bromate -ish thing here. The, the orange line, again, is prediction, and the measured bromate is actually the dots here. Um, that's a uh, simulation. Just checking uh, a technical issue. One moment, people at LinkedIn, don't be scared. We are coming back. I'm using two PCs and we had a we had an international internet issue at one of them. In the meantime, for the LinkedIn people, if you okay, we are back. Um, we are back. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Have yeah. you have you missed a lot? I hope not. No, we, we, we were uh, we were in the part that we're talking about using solo uh, for that uh, ozonation. Oh, okay, perfect. I was already scared that we that I lost you like uh, half an hour ago. <laughs> okay, good. We will continue. So, well, this is the same ozonation plant I was talking about, and what you see here is the bromate prediction. This is the orange line and the bromate data. This is actually the blue dots. Bromate is very hard to measure. You can see it in the measurement frequency because this is a period of five years. Huh? So this is a five years simulation. And if well, it's one of the benefits of these digital twins. It takes like two minutes to simulate five years. Uh, it's so great. We love it. Uh, of course, you, you have to have accurate models. But just imagine huh, that you can model five years in two minutes. Uh, that is really the power of it. Not many practitioners are aware of this. And then you have the final example here, um, which is the op process optimization or the retrofitting. Case example seven. It's a case in the Netherlands. Uh, this is uh, the retrofit of an old sludge homogenization tank. Okay, so they have activated sludge. They bring it in from different plants. And it's, yeah, I, I, it's... Looks like a circus a bit, this uh, this stand, but it's not. It is a sludge homogenization tank. This is the plant. And uh, there are a lot of challenges here. Huh? How do you mix this tank with the least amount of energy? What are the mixers you have to take? Yeah, to take. And what are the impeller speeds and things like that you have to A lot of scenarios can be done. How would you do that without computational fluid dynamics? It's a very hard question. Where do you put the Mixers, what is the best shape, angle, size, rotation speed of these mixers? Um, so we started with some scenarios. This is actually the 3D design, the simulation tool, the computational fluid dynamics tool. You see completely different than a flow sheet model. Huh? So a CFD model is a real 3D simulation of your tank, while uh, like a bio wind model is more like a block, a block type of process. 
You can look like the, at the mixing. We did a couple of scenarios, how it starts rotating, higher velocities in scenario two compared to one. But scenario one was already much better than this case. But let's look at some very nice images. Huh? This is what I can actually look at uh, for hours. What you see, will see here at the left is the basic design, the current one. Then we have scenario one where we install two extra impellers at the sides under a certain angle. And then we have scenario two where we have slightly rotated the two impellers. And we also changed a bit the rotation uh, speed. And of course, you, you can see there is much more movement <laughs> in scenario two. Um, there is much more movement in scenario one compared to the base case. But still in scenario one, there was a risk of struvite accumulation. So if you have struvite precipitation, uh, well, it might accumulate here. If it starts accumulating, it might form big chunks that might go uh, to the equipment later and damage it. So in this, in this case, we really wanted the good mixing. Okay, we are at the conclusions. I, I know it was a lot of information and uh, I'm very happy to uh, yeah, answer a lot of questions after this. This is my last slide. Um, well, the reason I think this seminar here is a bit more relevant compared to 10 years ago is because of a lot of things have changed. Huh? There are four big trends. On the one hand, you have big societal and market pressures, which are climate change, more stringent regulation, population growth, smarter end users. I mean, people that are now buying technology, also Google. They didn't maybe 20 years ago, but now, now people that built an activated switch system will do their homework. There are a lot of challenges, well, challenges there for vendors as well. Resource efficiency, including uh, energy reduction, smaller footprints, uh, process intensification, the shift from activated sludge to granular or MBBRs, for example. It's just one example. Doing more with less. And also the speed of society. So I think the window of opportunity of introducing a new technology is now shorter than compared to 20 years ago, for example. Big societal and market pressures. Then, of course, we have the general acceptance of digital. It's on the agenda in a lot of companies. Everybody is preparing for a digital technology. So if you now come with, hey, guys, we can help you with modeling, they will be less scared of it and more accepting compared to 20 or 10 years ago. On the other hand, we have great simulation models and tools that were developed throughout the years, which we didn't have before. Still, a lot of researchers and universities and consultants are developing even better models. And then, of course, what is a very, very important one, if especially if you look at computational fluid dynamics, is massive computing power. So, I mean, you can now run uh, simulations in the cloud at a fraction of the cost compared to five years ago. So, I mean, a CFD simulation can take uh, one hour, half an hour, 10 minutes, when it used to be days, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big change. Things have changed so fast that it's sometimes hard to grasp. Um, good, this was my presentation. I hope it was <laughs> a bit valuable for you. Uh, I, it's always difficult uh, with Zoom. I prefer online, uh, well, real, the real stuff. But we can do it in the future. Huh? I think we have to do it, redo it in person. Um, I thank you a lot for your attention and uh, yeah, I'm very curious about your questions.